Wait, did you ever wonder how all this happened? How you can turn that knob and enjoy a dramatic show, laugh at a comedian, watch the ball game, or hear and see news from anywhere in the world? Well, it's quite a story, the story of television. At the beginning, there were all kinds of different names for what we now call television. Some people called it radio vision or uh, the telephonoscope or audio vision or hear listening. Um, the name that finally stuck, of course, is television, although not everyone liked that. The editor of the Manchester Guardian in England said uh, television, the, the word is half Greek and half Latin. No good will come of it. What is the origin of that no-good technology that sits in our living rooms? The smooth electronic picture you're watching right now. Was it invented by an Idaho farm boy, a Russian immigrant, or a Scottish inventor named John Logie Baird? This is a 1930 Baird televisor. This was the first mass-produced television for the British television market, uh, essentially the first commercially available television for the average person to, to afford. You could buy this unit with a cabinet on it with a nice bronze plaque on the front for about 25 pounds. Baird's televisor, invented in 1929, looked radically different from the electronic tubes of modern television. Instead, his was a mechanical system made up of rapidly spinning, rotating parts. In Baird's mechanical television, light from a subject hit a spinning disc, breaking it into pieces. Each piece of light hit a photoelectric cell, which converted the light into electricity. A bright piece generated a lot of electricity, a dark piece a little. The changing electricity was sent to a receiver, causing a neon bulb to rapidly flicker bright or dark for each bit of the picture. A receiving disc, spinning at the same speed as the first, put the light and dark pieces back together like a jigsaw puzzle. Early television was a hit in 1925 when John Logie Baird displayed primitive images at a London department store. But when he applied for the first broadcast license ever, the BBC was nervous. Well, there were, there were two grounds to be afraid of television. One of them was the fear that it would uh, damage the morals of the populace. The other fear of television was uh, much more irrational, and that was the thought that if you had a television set in your house, uh, the BBC could see what you were doing. And uh, there was one woman who was afraid that the television set would be able to see through the bathroom wall, and she wrote a letter to the paper to this effect. But the, these fears have proved groundless. Mechanical TV did have real pitfalls. To show up on the screen, the actors had to wear bright blue paint to accentuate the eyebrows and lips. And the discs could never spin fast enough to create fluid motion. The images would always remain flickery and smudged. This Felix the Cat, the first ever cartoon character broadcast, was as good as it got. Baird's system never did catch on. Though a remarkable achievement, mechanical TV is now just a footnote in history. But even as Baird's idea failed, a new electronic vision was being born. The summer of 1921 found Philo T. Farnsworth in a sugar beet field in Rigby, Idaho, dreaming of trapping light in an empty jar and sending it one line at a time with a beam of electrons. So we'll pretend that we've got a, an illustration here of Farnsworth's beet field from the summer of 1921. And we find him tracing the rows across the beet field on his disc harrow one row after another monotonously into the afternoon and then he reaches a point he looks back behind him and he sees these rows in the dirt and at that moment he realizes how he can use electrons to trace a tv image and this is exactly how tv is rendered on your screen today one line at a time 525 lines per frame 30 frames per second, just the way Philo Farnsworth envisioned it on the back of a disc harrow in the summer of 1921. What 14-year-old Farnsworth realized with his tractor was that a beam of electrons could paint a picture finer and faster than a spinning disc. And it could be done with a cathode ray tube. A cathode ray tube is a glass tube with the, all the air pumped out of it. But it was discovered uh, that if you ran electricity through one end, through a filament at one end of the vacuum tube, 
that uh, electrons would flow from one end to the other. And that's when you have a cathode ray tube. That's called the cathode ray, that ray of electrons. Farnsworth's electronic television worked on the same principle as mechanical television, but instead of spinning discs, it used cathode ray tubes. The cathode ray tube fired electricity one pixel at a time, causing a special coating on the tube to glow. A lot of electricity created a bright spot, a little electricity a dark spot. The cathode ray tube could paint a picture in a thirtieth of a second, fast enough to create fluid motion. In 1926, with $25,000 in private funding, Farnsworth set up a lab in San Francisco to try to turn his beat field vision into reality. In this age, when, when they were beginning to develop electronic television, it's sort of analogous to wanting to invent a car but needing to invent the wheel first. So a lot of the stuff that they were developing in the laboratory that he really had to do from scratch. Cliff Gardner, who was Philo Farnsworth's brother-in-law, his wife's brother, he became an expert in glass blowing, and he had no schooling in that area either. And again, the advantage to not having any schooling was not knowing what could not be done and going ahead and doing what needed to be done. Uh, I believe 1929, there was a fire in the lab that destroyed most of uh, the equipment that they were working with. But uh, there were always very high voltages present that could uh, give somebody a tremendous shock. And there's some stories about people in the lab gang uh, getting potassium in their eyes and, and uh, having their eyesight threatened. Farnsworth was nearing success, but he had a rival, the brilliant Russian engineer Vladimir Zworkin. As early as 1923, Zworkin had submitted a patent for his own television system, but it was denied because it didn't quite work. He was now trying to perfect his system for the radio giant RCA and their visionary president, David Sarnoff, who saw television's future. Well, I think one of the great uh, marriages in uh, 20th century science, if you will, was the relationship between uh, Dr. Zworkin and David Sarnoff. Sarnoff was like this great monopoly master buying up all the hotels on the boardwalk and he didn't want to pay anyone. He wanted to have total patent control over television. And uh, he was hoping Zvar Zvarkin would do that for him. But Farnsworth was ahead of them and had some patents from 1927, 1928. Zvarkin is given instructions to visit Farnsworth's lab in 1930. And Farnsworth does not know that Zvarkin is actually working for RCA because he comes from the Westinghouse labs. So Farnsworth is very forthcoming, believing that he has met a fe fellow traveler on this new frontier. He is entirely forthcoming and shows him virtually everything that he has developed in the last three or four years in San Francisco. And he shows Zworkin the finished image dissector tube, and Zworkin holds it in his hand. And there are many eyewitnesses to, that heard him say, this is a beautiful instrument. I wish that I had invented it. Whether Zworkin actually stole Farnsworth's design is unclear, but shortly after his visit, he finally had an electronic camera tube that worked. It even made a brighter picture than Farnsworth's. Under a quirk of patent law, he was able to submit his new system under the original 1923 patent. Meanwhile, Farnsworth had also been successful with his camera and receiver. The key to both men's success? the cathode ray tube, which is why we still call television the tube. But who got there first, the corporate spy or the Idaho farm boy with the beat field vision? Claim 15 in Farnsworth's patent 1773-980 proves that Farnsworth is truly the father of electronic television. Schwarkin is the father of television, there is no doubt about that. I mean, it is filed in the U.S. Patent Office in the late uh, fall of 1923, the first patent of, a, of, a, of an electronic uh, television uh, tube. He is the father of television. It was up to the courts to decide. The patent battle raged for years. And the final decision? The father of the modern television, Philo Farnsworth. It was a big victory for Farnsworth and certainly a great defeat for RCA. David, David Sarnoff couldn't have been happy about this. It meant they were going to have to pay royalties. So patent control for electronic television belonged to Farnsworth. 
But the problem is he may have done it too early. He got his first patents in 1927. And by the time television got going commercially after the war, because World War II delayed things for five years, uh, many of his patents had expired. So he was not no longer receiving royalties for it, and RCA had taken over the manufacturing of television sets, and Farnsworth just got left in the cold. Farnsworth may have won in court, but he lost in the marketplace. Today, we all know his invention, but we barely know the name Philo Farnsworth. And what would the rival inventors think of what's become of television? There's one very interesting story um, about your work, and I believe it was in Canada in 1954, when some Canadian reporter asked him what his favorite thing was on television. And he always had a very um, pronounced Russian accent to the end of his life. He said, the switch. And the man said, I beg your pardon. He said, the switch to turn the damn thing off. <laughs> he, was, um, he was very saddened that television didn't realize its potential. But in July of 1969, Farnsworth and his wife sat in their home in Salt Lake City. And they watched Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. And he turned to his wife and he said, this has made it all worthwhile. <laughs>